issue can occur first is there enough capacity of local contractors to implement the 860 billion uh, and uh, six, the 860 billion US dollar uh, the Philippine peso 2017 infrastructure budget of the Philippines and subsequently the 8 trillion projected six year infrastructure budget. Uh, Jesse was talking about capacity. Uh, hopefully, I can answer that question. The second issue is uh, the availability of skilled manpower. And uh, the third issue is why the largest Philippine contractors are not involved in government infrastructure. So uh, with that, an introduction, I'd like to present first the infrastructure budget for 2017. I hope my figures are right. Uh, the source is uh, indicated there. I think Kathy Cabral talked to you about uh, the DPWH budget. The actual DPWH infra budget is about 430 billion. Uh, however, I think she presented to you a bigger number. The reason why there's a bigger number is because some of the infrastructure budgets of the other agencies are being administered by the DPWH. So just bear in mind, it's 860 billion pesos for 2017. That's roughly about 17 billion US dollars. So, uh, Inevitably, before I can discuss capacity, we should look at uh, certain regulations and practices uh, that are prevail prevailing in the procurement of projects for government infrastructure. I will also discuss, for the benefit of the foreigners, how you can get in and participate. First of all, locally financed projects. That is where the 860 billion uh, Philippine pesos come in. Participation as mandated by law is 75% Filipino, 25% foreign. So when you apply for a license with pickup and you're applying for what we call an interagency classification, it's a classification that will allow you to automatically join locally funded uh, government projects, they will look at your foreign equity. If it exceeds 25%, they will not give you an interagency classification. The basis for this, and uh, you can do your research, is the Foreign Investments Act of 1991. The uh, Foreign Investments Act is a dynamic piece of legislation because it deals with uh, negative lists. So, just as an illustration, I give you the next slide. I just call your attention to the middle box, locally funded public works projects. Only 25% foreign equity allowed. But from time to time, these negative lists are and can be adjusted. So for those of you interested on foreign equity in construction, you can take a look at the last box. However, if you check with the NEDA board, some years ago, they removed construction from this 40% foreign, foreign equity allowed negative list. So the question is, is there enough local capacity to do the 75%? To illustrate local capacity, we have to go back to the number of accredited contractors. As of 31 December 2016, PCAP has accredited a little over 8,000 contractors. And out of the eight, over 8,000, over 6,000 have an interagency classification. Okay, so 
let me talk about capacity. This is a simple formula. It's very conservative. It's a rough estimate. The formula is net worth, or if you're a new company, capital, times 15, which is the multiplier being used by the PWH, and you get what they call a net financial contracting capacity. It's a simple, a very simple formula. Uh, if you uh, bid with the uh, DPWH, they constantly check on your NFCC. So NFCC, once you get that number, they will check what your ongoing projects are. If your ongoing projects exceed the, the value of your ongoing projects, exceed your NFCC, they won't allow you to bid. So, on the first uh, column, this is the breakdown of contractors accredited by PICAP based on their categories. So now we have uh, basically four categories. Quadruple A, Triple A, Double A, A, B, C, D, and E. Okay? On that third column, you can see the net minimum net worth requirement. Meaning, to qualify for a quadruple A category, you would need 1 billion pesos in net worth. Converted to US dollars, that's only 20 million US dollars. Okay? There are actually six that have been accredited as of uh, 31 December. However, I did not include the two 100% foreign owned companies that were given a quadruple A license. By the way, it's a regular license. Okay. Now, there are 341 AAA, 128 AA, 989 AA, and so on and so forth. If you run through the formula and get the total, the total is about 953 billion. That's the total potential NFCC of all accredited PICAP contractors. Mind you, this is very conservative because we're only looking at minimum <coughs> net worth requirements. We have to admit, it's been a perennial problem of regulators. We have thousands of contractors that are not accredited. We have thousands of contractors that are doing construction work without the benefit of the license. That has been a continued uh, challenge to the regulators. However, it's like an underground economy. Uh, most of the subcontractors and specialty, specialty contractors operate without a license. There's no way we can estimate their capacity. Uh, I can throw uh, any figure at you. Uh, and, and nobody can say whether that's right or that's wrong. But there is some significant hidden capacity. I consider this as a, as a sub-issue. Are there any foreign players that want to do the 25%? Oops. That's the answer. More than likely, they would not be interested because the uh, contract amounts should be too small for somebody foreign to come in and join, and they can only participate in 25%. But some players do come in as material or technology providers. Okay, foreign assisted projects. What is the law governing foreign assisted projects? Well, it's basically the terms of the loan agreement. If the uh, loan is granted by, say, the World Bank or the ADB or uh, JICA, we now have what we call a unified uh, uh, rules and regulations for these uh, agencies. In general, all member countries are allowed to participate no matter what nationality they are. 
So if the United States of America is a member of the World Bank or the ADB, then their contractors can come in and participate in this project. Another sub-issue is, are the contract packages attractive enough for foreign contractors to come in? For purposes of perspective, I have a few slides for you. First, the last single biggest or largest project implemented in the Philippines was the Subic Clark Tarlac Expressway. Initially, I think it is in the vicinity of 26 billion pesos. Uh, I have reliable uh, information that it ballooned to about 35 uh, Philippine peso after it was escalated. So, converted to U.S. dollars, that would be about 700 million U.S. dollars, okay? Uh, just, just remember uh, this figure. Uh, the next slide will show you a list of the top 15 contractors in the world. Number 15 is Obayashi Corporation, and their annual turnover in 2015 was in the vicinity of 16 billion US dollars. So, hypothetical question. Will Obayashi Gumi be interested in coming to the Philippines for a 700 million US dollar project? Hypothetical, maybe. Okay. Uh, will China Railway Construction Engineering Corporation be interested? Uh, the answer will be given later. So another slide. This slide shows you, again, just to get proper perspective, on the construction outputs of, I think this is the top 30, top 20 countries in the world. I was surprised to see that number one was India. Colombia is 29 billion. The Philippines is 17 billion. Okay. Uh, next year, if it uh, goes up to 1 trillion pesos, maybe we're looking at 20 uh, billion US dollars. However, that does not include uh, a very important class of projects the build, operate, and transfer, or public private partnership projects. This is only hard infra based on uh, government uh, budgets. So this is a very important sub-issue because as far as foreign assisted projects, the bias is in favor of foreign contractors. Very few local contractors, and you can study all the records historically, will qualify to participate in foreign assisted projects. Okay? That's why there's been a clamor to change all these rules. Uh, because like the World Bank would give, not only require you for a uh, two or three similar projects in magnitude and in scope, they go down to as detailed as your annual production rates for, say, excavation, for concrete, etc. That's why it's so difficult for Philippine-based contractors, number one, to acquire its experience. Uh, because by nature, you don't have such big projects here. Okay. This is the third type, which I mentioned earlier. Public, private, and uh, or build, operate, and transfer projects. Here, the projects are proponent-led. The contractors do not submit tenders. It is the project proponent that submits a tender. And the project proponent decides the nationality of its contractors. And what is the basis? Well, you can research. It was originally uh, Republic Act 6957, which is the Build, Operate, and Transfer Law, 
it was subsequently amended by Republic Act 7718. And what is the important, what are the important uh, uh, provisions as far as we're concerned is number one, the proponent can engage services of a foreign and or Filipino contractor. And the only other limitation is if it's a utility, 60% Filipino ownership is required. If opportunities are on in PPP DOP. These are just a listing of uh, partially completed and some ongoing projects. And there's a huge one, 5 trillion pesos. The Manila Bay Integrated Flood Control Coastal Defense and Expressway Project. That is still in the pipeline. It hasn't been tendered yet. There are also huge opportunities in ASEAN. Okay. The ASEAN Secretariat says that US dollar 110 billion annually is going to be the spend for PPP so that the member countries could catch up. And the projection goes all the way to 2025. Okay. Just to give perspective again, uh, you just did up 110, uh, 20 from 110. So there's still 90 uh, billion US dollars for the rest of ASEAN. You just allocate 20 billion to the Philippines. Okay. I'd also like to discuss the quadruple A license. Uh, I was still in pickup when this was approved. It allows for a 100% foreign-owned construction company to register and apply for and be given a regular license. Before, foreigners could come in if they wanted to join 25% of locally funded or if they were member countries of uh, foreign-assisted uh, loan originators, they would have to apply for a special license. Also, they could apply for special license based on a joint venture or a consortium. Okay. Today, we have six with quadruple A licenses. Uh, there are a number of applications. Four of them are Filipino, 100% Filipino. Two of them are 100% foreign. Uh, one very important limitation for the quadruple A is, number one, they can only participate in privately owned projects. Minimum 5 billion pesos value if it's building. Minimum 3 billion value if it's horizontal. Okay. So, the next issue. The current inventory of ongoing projects, both in the public and private sector, are suffering delays due to the lack of skilled manpower. I consider it a contractor excuse. Uh, when a project starts getting delayed, the owner's rep or the project manager says, Oh, you gave uh, us a manpower schedule, and your manpower schedule says you have to supply a thousand workers at this point in time. You only have 875. You have to supply the 125 immediately. And within a period of time, you supply the 125, he or she will say, you can't catch up with this rate. You have to either do overtime, or double the number of workers so that you can catch up. I'm saying that there are a myriad number of reasons other than manpower and their skills. It all starts with, as Jesse was saying, capacity and developing capacity properly. You know, it's strange. 
for you to hear from a contractor a statement that says delays start even before projects are started. And how can that be? How can a project be delayed even before it started? I give you one scenario. You are asked by an owner to start a project with incomplete plans. And I say to you, 50% of the projects going on in Metro Manila do not have complete plans. That's a clear example that you are already delayed even before you even started. Another main reason for being delayed is starting at the wrong time. The best time to start a project in Metro Manila is January. If you have not poured your foundations by May, you will surely be delayed. So what do I advise people who give me ask for my advice? If you can't start in January, think about starting next season. So it's not maybe sometimes it's manpower and skills. But it's mostly poor planning. I uh, I have to say, aside from road right to pro of way pro problems and access problems, one common problem is shortage of basic materials. <coughs> Perspective: 600 million bags of cement was used in the Philippines last year. But only, but only 260 million was locally produced. We had to import about 40 million bags of cement. And the 40 million bags were imported mostly in the second half. The budgets were, did not reach the trillion level at that time. I tell you, there will be a serious shortage of rebar and cement in 2017. Okay. I'll just read this and you can read it with me. The easiest scapegoat for delays is the lack of skilled manpower. In my view, poor pre-construction planning, lack of competent construction managers, and low worker productivity are the main culprits. Okay. Uh, I just call your attention to the last two sentences. There's a tremendous pool, uh, albeit uh, unskilled, that we can tap from. Okay. They can do training on the job. I'm not going to say that they'll be as productive as somebody that's got two, three years experience, but you can use them. But we have an untapped pool of very skilled workers. There are 15 million overseas workers from the Philippines deployed all over the world. And at least a million of those workers are construction workers. If you can give them proper incentive to come home, they will surely be able to help in our infrastructure problem. It's just not just the contractors that will help. Filipino workers can give their own contributions. Okay, why are the largest Philippine contractors participating? See, I'm, I'm sort of winding up. Uh, in that meeting that we had in the CIAP, I think the top five Philippine contractors were in attendance. Uh, I think not one of them had any ongoing projects. No, no, I stand corrected. A few of them were involved in public-private uh, projects. But they could not be considered as generally direct contractors of Philippine government infrastructure. So why are they staying away? 
unfavorable governance practices in the procurement of and implementation of projects. This is a very diplomatic way of uh, saying something. My foreign friends are smiling. Uh, I will remain diplomatic. Uh, I think you understand. Okay? When you talk about governance practices, you know exactly what I mean. Of course, there are more than enough projects in the private sector to keep these big contractors busy. Uh, I think the housing market, uh, mostly condominiums, for 2016, if I'm not mistaken, was about 40 billion. 40 billion, 50 pesos. Okay? And, as I was referring to that one participant, there are already participants indirectly, some as part proponents and others as contractors of proponents of PPP projects. A uh, special perspective, the top seven largest contractors in the world are Chinese. Uh, most, if not all, are state-owned. And if you see the construction output of China as against the capacity of their contractors, there is too much capacity for them to stay in China. So they will come. So I'm just saying that it's not really a skilled manpower pro problem. It is a lack of competent planners and construction to supervisors and managers. And this must be addressed because you don't manufacture supervisors and managers in a short period of time. Okay. That is why I am proposing that maybe we should tap the construction managers that we have deployed overseas and give them some incentive to come here. One of the biggest incentives is to give them the same tax-free privileges as they are enjoying today that they are deployed overseas. Okay? Productivity must be addressed. I'll give you an example of productivity. When I was a young contractor many years ago, a lot of contractors still use uh, single bagger mixers. You've seen one of those. I had a crew of six doing exactly the same thing that 12 people will be doing today. That's in my short lifetime. So that is what I exactly mean when I say productivity. The wages have gone up, but productivity has gone down. Okay. To the large construction companies, of course, government must entice them and encourage them to participate. But I have another call. I, my call is for love of country. I know it's difficult to deal with government. But please harness your patriotic, your patriotism. Bear with us, join government projects. Unified pre-qualification system, not every agency having its own. Uh, we can all go back to the pickup interagency classification to make it simple. Uh, one way of addressing the governance practices is to increase participation in tenders and bids. If this number cannot be controlled by the powers that be, then your government governance practices immediately improve. Uh, I talk about productivity, I talk about the tax exemption, I talk about a dedicated infrastructure fund to help contractors finance their projects, uh, not using collateral, but using projects as their collateral. A training, training levy so that our training will be sustainable. Okay. Uh, Lastly, I would uh, ask 
those that come up with the training modules to put a module there to teach our workers how to become entrepreneurs. Uh, I had some experiences with my subcontractors. They will secure a license this year, next year. They won't renew. And I asked them why. Sir, I don't know how to file an income tax return. And an income tax return is a requirement for the renewal. So we need people who will handhold uh, these subcontractors. The current procurement procedures and practices must be overhauled so that a uniform, transparent, fair, and honest tendering process is assured. The biggest contractors will participate if they are confident that they have a fair chance of qualifying and submitting a competitive bid without having to bother with outside influences. I think that, as, that is as diplomatic as I can be. Thank you very much and good afternoon.